Okay, well, thanks for the opportunity to speak, and thanks to the organizers for putting together what promises to be a really interesting and enlightening conference. And um, I had the privilege of leading a collaborative research effort of the uh, Society of Dermatology Hospitalists on SJSTEN over the last few years, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about um, our group and what we've done, um, and then a little bit about what we hope to do in the future. So first, a little bit about our group. Uh, the Society of Dermatology Hospitalists uh, is a group of medical dermatologists who specialize in inpatient consultative dermatology. Our members serve as full-time inpatient consultants for a significant portion of our work. And uh, we represent many of the large academic medical centers in the United States. So in this capacity, we have uh, the opportunity to manage rare diseases, and we're often the face of dermatology to our medical colleagues. And this really presents a great opportunity to us, both clinically and from a research perspective, um, to interface with our colleagues. The SDH is active in clinical care, education, and research. Uh, we have twice yearly meetings, a board of directors, and a committee structure, as well as a listserv that helps facilitate our clinical discussions and communication on research efforts. And finally, there's a scientific task force, of which I'm a member, uh, that has monthly conference calls and serves really as a clearinghouse for our research efforts. So a member who's uh, got a research initiative, can bring that to the scientific task force, can receive open uh, feedback and refine that idea before taking it to the group at large. So with that background in mind, we um, decided to look at our collective uh, experience with SJSTEN um, to, uh, with a goal really of describing the SJSTEN experience of dermatology hospitalists in the United States uh, with respect to causality, severity, and outcomes, um, hopefully to add some clarity to ongoing management controversies um, particularly pharmaco pharmacotherapeutic management of SJSTEN. And we also were hoping to provide a proof of concept uh, for these types of collaborative studies within complex medical dermatology, within the Medical Derm Society and the Society of Dermatology Hospitalists. Um, really, this is because rare disease research cannot be done alone, at least not well. Uh, so back in the spring of 2014, I developed an, an initial protocol, an IRB application and REDCap a database, uh, and then worked with the scientific task force in an iterative process to refine um, our protocol before taking it to the group at large. And this third step here was really a key step because we said to the group, essentially, we're openly sharing everything, all of these regulatory documents, protocol, et cetera, and anyone who participates, anyone who works uh, on this is going to share uh, in the um, academic output of that project. Um, data was entered by the different participating centers, and then over the last several months, we've been analyzing our data, and we have our initial manuscripts um, prepared for publication at this time. So this is just a screenshot of our REDCap uh, tool. So really, this was a, a true collaborative effort. We ended up having 18 centers that worked together to do, to, to do the work, um, to get up and running and enter data, and obviously without uh, these uh, participants, this would not have worked. Ultimately, we had a total of 405 patients uh, that were entered into the database, treated between 2000 and 2015, mostly within the last six years. And while I'd like to have the time to review in detail and discuss in detail all of our results, I don't this morning, but I'd like to hit a couple of the high points, if I may. Um, in our group, 91% of SJST in cases were induced by medication, and the single most common drug uh, culprit was termethoprim sulfamethoxazole. The average patient in our cohort uh, presented with extensive skin involvement with a mean BSA of 24% and two-thirds meeting criteria for TEN or SGSTN overlap. The predicted mortality in our cohort was 20%. Uh, two-thirds of our group was managed in a specialized unit, either an ICU or a burn center, and 70% received a particular pharmacotherapy for SGSTN. Most commonly, this was steroids, IVIG, both IVIG and steroids. Um, and really, very few patients, only four patients received cyclosporine and one patient etanercept in this cohort. Our overall and subgroup mortality was less than predicted by score 10. Um, the predicted mortality, as I mentioned, was 20%. Our actual mortality was 13.7 for a standardized mortality ratio of 0.69. And adjusting for score 10, there was a trend toward decreased mortality in the steroid plus IVIG group, people who received uh, both agents. That standardized mortality ratio was 0.51. Um, compared to uh, IVIG or steroids alone in supportive care only. Um, and we found no difference between so-called high-dose IVIG or low-dose IVIG with respect to outcomes. We did, however, see an apparent bias toward prescribing IVIG in more severe disease. So our patients who received IVIG had higher body surface area involvement, more TEN, and more severe mucosal involvement at the time of admission. 
So this was one of the largest existing SJSTN cohorts. Uh, we found that trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole was the most common cause. Um, and our management choices really mirrored what we know of U.S. practice. So more uh, providers were more likely to use IVIG if there was more severe disease, more likely to use IVIG if they saw more, uh, more SJSTN in general. And so because this was a, a cohort made up of um, patients of people who see uh, SJST infrequently as inpatient consulting dermatologists, we used IVIG in this group uh, quite extensively. Um, but clearly there was an overall lack of consensus on what to do for these patients. Um, so the preferred pharmacologic management really remains unclear. It's not clear that any uh, therapy, at least in, that was tested in, or that was observed in our group, uh, improves overall survival over supportive care. IVIG may be no more beneficial than steroids or IVIG plus steroids. And there's no evidence in our cohort, at least, that high-dose IVIG is superior to lower doses, that this is our practice. We're really unable to say anything about cyclosporin or TNF inhibitors because of the small numbers uh, in our cohort. Our overall survival rate was better than predicted uh, and better than in the literature, which is a published mortality rate of about 20 to 25 percent. In our cohort, it was 13.7. And our standardized mortality ratio of 0.69 was also lower than what's in the literature. And it's unclear why this was, uh, whether it was due to the fact that these are all tertiary uh, centers, whether uh, we had increased utilization of ICU over burn unit uh, over what uh, ICU and burn unit over what's in the literature, whether uh, having a consulting dermatologist was an important factor, or whether there's a need to update SCORE 10 as a predictive tool. So our ongoing analyses include um, looking at ways to perhaps to update SCORE 10 to, to improve mortality prediction, and you'll see an abstract on that in a, in a few minutes. Um, and our, uh, we're looking at ways to um, further analyze, uh, analyze, uh, analyze our uh, cohort using things like propensity score matching. Um, we're also looking at things like quality of life among our survivors um, and uh, looking to utilize our existing network, now about 25 sites, to conduct a prospective uh, study and ultimately a randomized control trial. So really this was a proof of concept for our group to work in a large collaborative research effort. Uh, it, it's a means to leverage individual experience with rare diseases. Um, dermatology hospitalists care for patients with SJSTN uh, routinely. We realize our strengths really are clinical expertise and access to patients, but we can benefit from translational and basic science partnerships to study uh, more and learn more about the pathogenesis of the disease. And really, there are huge unanswered questions very clearly, um, but together we have the ability to build knowledge, and our group intends to continue working on SJSTN and looks forward to partnering um, with others in this room to improve our understanding and therapies of this important disease. So I want to thank uh, those who worked on this uh, effort, including our dermatoepidemiology group at Penn and all of the collaborating centers, and I thank you for your attention. So hello, uh, my name is Brandon Worley. I'm uh, representing the uh, nation's uh, clinical trial network. Uh, and uh, I'm here on behalf of uh, many of my colleagues. Um, so just to try to talk about, so what's our main clinical problem in terms of therapeutics in SJSTEN? So mainly we have that the weight of evidence, and we just saw this as well uh, from uh, our previous presenter, uh, that the lack, there seems to be a lack of benefit for IVIG and non-pulse corticosteroids. Um, we do actually have limited favorable observation data from uh, cyclosporin and etanercept, including a uh, single open phase uh, two trial from Dr. Rougeau's group uh, showing benefit. Um, but we know that we need better outlines as observational data can actually only take us so far. Uh, we need an objective way to tell what makes a difference and what doesn't. Um, also, we have been a little uh, slow in that we know a lot of what happens about SGST and we'll have a lot of basic science expertise ongoing about this disease. But I've had very minimal crosstalk between what the bench and the bedside are doing to be able to inform our therapeutics further. So the advantages of trial networks is that they can actually provide a mechanism to answer research goals in an effective and clear way. You're able to leverage expertise um, about new and innovative ideas from the experts that you have involved. And you have the ability to perform prospect studies efficiently and in a rare disease effectively, as doing a couple sites or a few small centers um, will not necessarily yield you uh, what you need uh, in terms of proving actual drug benefit, especially in SJST and where we're not sure if it makes a real difference. Um, there's also um, can promote generalizability and protocol-driven practice uh, within these networks as often when you have critical uptake of uh, many centers, 
you can then provide further direction to many of those that's generalizable and works well. So that's, in fact, what we did. Um, so we put together uh, a 20-site uh, trial network uh, full of three sites in Canada, uh, four, uh, 17 in the U.S., um, coordinated by Vanderbilt for the U.S. centers, and the Canadian sites are coordinated by uh, University of Ottawa. Uh, this has a large uh, mechanistic aim, looking at both uh, peripheral uh, blood uh, to look at what is going on in the inflammasome and T cells peripherally, as well as at the effector site uh, within skin and blister fluid. Um, our scientific hub is through Vanderbilt, um, that then will pass it out to uh, CHIRP, which is at Walter Reed, through um, our colleague also at uh, San Antonio. Um, and then also, uh, the Ottawa has also designed pharmacokinetics to really uh, target not only uh, what is happening with these patients and when we treat them, how the drug is moving through their system, but really are there targets that we need to hit in terms of actual dosing for this to be effective, because we, we currently don't know. So our timeline is that 2017 this year, we have a non-randomized uh, open-label pilot study to actually standardize supportive care across uh, all of our uh, sites, as we've actually created a protocol um, in conjunction with many people for both uh, general care and ocular care, um, and to test the overall trial procedures and standardize the outcome measures. In 2018, um, we're looking to actually have a full uh, rollout of a phase three double-blind randomized control trial for cyclosporine and etanercept compared to supportive care alone. And this is to be completed over four years. So, uh, so the big advantage of having uh, transitional, uh, translational medicine within an actual trial is that there are serious benefits to telling you how drug therapy works and why you maybe have a negative result. So in doing this trial, I'm not sure whether we'll have a positive or, or neutral result, meaning that supportive care is just as good as giving a drug. However, it was important to us to build into this a systematic assessment of the inflammasome and whether or not we see the actual drugs affecting the downstream pathway to say that, yes, we are affecting that pathway and this is what the clinical response we see, or we're seeing this res response, but we're not affecting the pathway we thought we were, um, or we're not affecting that pathway and we see no clinical outcome. So clinical, uh, they enhance the proof of efficacy and the disease understanding in real clinical situations. So ours, again, to go over them for the nation's uh, trial scientific aims, are to demonstrate the treatment meaningfully alters the inflammasome, the effector site, to demonstrate a common immune and molecular pathway irrespective of drug cause or HLA genotype. It's our hypothesis that the HLA is an initiator for the, and it has a broad diversity for specific drugs and then leads down to an end effector that we know and call sgs -TEM. And define, and uh, one of the big goals for us also, which hasn't been really defined yet, is defining the immune system during the recovery period um, out to about a year uh, to actually see what is happening in these patients and whether we've changed any of their uh, resident T cells or things that, that usually may be still active at that time and may lead to recurrent TEM. Um, finally, uh, these, uh, so the principal outcomes overall is that the first trial to rigorously and objectively address uh, drug break FC in SGS TEN and specifically looking at a re as, a, as an endpoint, uh, defining uh, the objective strategies to assess outcomes in prospective studies so that not only we will do this trial now but can create a roadmap for doing future prospective work, and then the first use immunogenetics to support efficacy in a phase three study, and also looking at the pharmacokinetics, especially for cyclosporin, where we know in the bone marrow transplant uh, group it actually makes a big difference in terms of immunosuppression but we don't know in terms of dermatology patients overall. We tend to dose by weight. Um, future possibilities, uh, we really have uh, a few unexplored targets we could actually go after knowing what we know about uh, SGSTEN. So tocolizumab is currently an IL-6 inhibitor, and we know IL-6 has a synergistic effect with IL-15 um, and in the body on T cells, and whether or not that's a possible target. Surolimus is talked about now in the GVHT community of being mTOR IL-15. Uh, IL-15 has a big role in the prognostic factor and severity of sgs -CEN. And then to, uh, tofacitinib or JAK IL-15 um, also has a possibility. The, uh, then also an, an undeveloped uh, area yet is whether or not directly inhibiting granulysin, which is the effector protein, would be something that could be in support in the future. And these has also offshoots into GVHG like in and psoriasis is that's also associated with that disease, those diseases. Finally, post-trial horizons 
uh, that we're hoping to be able to push ourselves towards are that we can creating models uh, to address uh, uh, SGST ther um, SGSTE and therapeutics and low resource health systems. Um, as this is a problem, so we may be able to do this for North America, but what, what about some place that doesn't necessarily have easy access to cyclosporin or tanercept? Uh, use of a smart or adaptive designs, and then also using uh, clinical biomarkers to establish and monitor disease therapy, and whether or not in the future we can design drugs to protect the immune system from possible HLA associations. So really appreciate your attention, and uh, happy to answer any questions. I'm always reachable by that email. Lucky to have Professor um, Bruce Charlton. Um, he's a Professor of Pediatrics and Co-Chair, Division of Translational Therapeutics, Faculty of Medicine, University of British Columbia. Columbia. Thank you. Okay, so I'll just talk a little bit about our network in Canada that we run called the CPNDS, or the Canadian Pharmacogenomic Network for Drug Safety. We're more than about dermatology, but uh, mostly dermatologists here, so I'm uh, excited to tell you what we're working on in the, in, in, in the area of dermatology. We have uh, a surveillance network that now is uh, 26 sites, all academic uh, health centers across the country. Um, I pay the surveillance folks, the clinician surveillors at each of these sites, uh, most of these sites, all of the pediatric sites and some of the adult sites, and that way the data that I get is actually what I want and not what people say they have time to do or they think I want. Um, this is a big difference with many networks in that um, I get Instead of getting, you know, rash as a reaction, I don't know what to do with that, um, I get the kinds of data that I want. Um, and I hire and fire based on performance like any employee. The basic strategy for biomarker discovery, which is one of the principal things that we do, is, uh, is identifying cases and match controls. We identify any control, um, mostly children since I'm in the Department of Pediatrics. Almost all of our cases are pediatric, um, but not exclusively. Uh, and we'll select children that have also received the same medication without the reaction and then later match to, to come up with optimal populations for study. We collect DNA, almost all of it's saliva-based. Um, blood is a little bit more logistically challenging to collect in children, um, and it's just easier to collect saliva at the point of, uh, of consenting. Uh, we do very detailed uh, clinical characterizations. This is something that is really the the sentinel future, I think, for, for pharmacogenomic discovery is that if you have a poor phenotype, P, I don't know what to do with the genotype. Uh, we screen, of course, the uh, genetic variants with both custom and commercial arrays, and then we replicate to understand generalizability. Um, these are the case report numbers as of January. We're ne nearly approaching 100,000 now, which is amazing. I've never done a clinical trial that's been this successful. And um, I keep buying more freezers for all of the samples that we have. And most of, uh, we still have the whole collection. It has created a database of drug outcome information, particularly in children, that is, I think, um, fairly significant. Um, the characterization of adverse event is not, uh, not, no disrespect to my dermatology colleagues, but that's not enough just to tell me that it's an SJS case. Uh, so we spend um, between a half a day and up to five days characterizing an event. Um, I put this picture because two of my nurses here are reviewing one patient's medical record. Uh, yes, it's still paper-based in British Columbia. Unfortunately, we're moving to electronic systems, but we measure charts in meters versus centimeters in children that have cancer. And so to go through everything and characterize the event and concomitant drugs, since I'm the chair of clinical pharmacology, um, I'm particularly interested in concomitant medications and how that changes response. Um, this is an example of, of the data collection for our meal. Shearer and I and, and others, one of, our, one of my most fantastic postdocs, worked on, on this particular uh, issue, which is what data do we need? And I learned very early on in this network that what people tell you they have, what, the, what they provide you is the data that's accessible in the record. But because these charts are meters and not centimeters, I want to know about all of these things. So if you don't have photographs, that's fine. Mark it down that you don't have photographs. But I don't want you not to include them and then say that, you know, and then I have to ask later, well, did you have them or not? Were they available or were they not? And same with any of these systems. So this is a data collection form that says these are the data that you have to respond to absolutely in every case. These are very small. If you want these, uh, this information, I'm happy to provide it later. 
Uh, then we go through the process of characterizing the reaction by morphology, by mucous membrane involvement, by the percentage of body surface area involvement, all to help the clinician surveillors understand what type of reaction we're looking at. Since we're not dermatologists, uh, we want to review these things very carefully. Um, we move from there to other organ involvement. Um, and Neil always talks about organitis. What are the other organs that are involved beyond the skin? Uh, we look for fever specifically um, and other things, and this is how we end up with our characterization of, of the dermatologic event. Um, we do a case assessment to understand, in this case, hypersensitivity syndrome, um, the, uh, the clinical presentation and the drug uh, involvement. Um, these aren't to be read, but they're just to say that we do all of this kind of scoring. Same thing for SJSTEN. Um, so I believe that our cases are actually uh, excellent um, in terms of the phenotypes. Um, this was a paper that we published looking at genetic markers in children. It was the first pediatric paper actually done in this particular area. Um, uh, Ursula Amstutz, who's one of my former postdocs and now at the Inselspital in, in Bern, uh, and I wrote these, uh, these and, and other authors wrote these recommendations for uh, testing uh, to reduce the risk of carbamazepine-induced hypersensitivity. Um, we now are working with the epilepsy uh, pharmacogenomic network in, uh, in I primarily in Ireland, but in, the, in, in Europe, to look specifically at um, markers of anti-epileptic drug-induced uh, hypersensitivity reactions. Um, they have 15 centers, we have 26. Um, we're specifically interested in hypersensitivity syndrome and SJSTEN from anti-epileptic drugs in our first analysis. Um, and all of these cases have been array genotype, both whole, whole genome and HLA imputation, as well as exome sequenced. We did replicate the HLA um, marker for car carbamazepine and the CYP2C9 star 3 phenytoin association. Uh, and we certainly are open to new collaborations to increase the sample size. Um, in other words, move towards these multidisciplinary networks that Elizabeth has been pushing for to help us understand better uh, predictive markers. And there is a poster with my second most important postdoc, uh, Dr. Galen Wright, who's here today um, uh, presenting some of our, of our findings. Uh, we have a new study uh, looking at MPE um, with uh, Patrick Kwan in Australia. Um, and this is to look both at integrative genomic and, and mechanistic basis of anti-epileptic induced uh, cutaneous reactions. He's a neurologist. Um, and uh, we are uh, both with the Epilepsy PGX Network and CPNDS we've added uh, with the Australians to put this together. So another example of how three groups are coming together to study something that's very important. Uh, we have 26 patients currently recruited with 27 different MPE events. Um, and I've listed the ancestries and some of the numbers. So st still fairly small, but m moving together in pediatrics across these uh, international borders really helps us to, to improve sample size. And then we have 170 drug-exposed patient controls for those medications to use. Um, total numbers of serious cutaneous adverse reactions are listed here within the network. I just did a quick scan before I came. Uh, I might have missed a few, but this is basically what we have at the moment. Again, these are pediatric. Um, the pan-Canadian pharmacogenomic panels, we just got a pile of money, I love saying that actually, um, from the Canadian federal government. Uh, to bring uh, pharmacogenomics uh, into ambulatory care, and we're working on deciding which variants uh, to include and, and uh, the strength of the association and what uh, generates um, uh, the quality evidence sufficient to, to, to test for these things. Um, I've been very pleased with the federal government's response and, and granting agencies to help us do this. These are just some of the HLA variants we're looking at. There are other things that we're doing as well. Um, our whole network is not just about discovering and replicating variants. We're also very interested um, in validation, functional and pharmacokinetic validation of markers, translating the work into practice, the whole science of translation. How do you get clinicians to do these things? How do they use them? How do you disseminate the knowledge? And then finally, um, if this is good enough for Canada, why is it not good enough for the world's children? So creating uh, commercial partnerships to allow access to this type of testing. Um, globally is really important. So we start with a patient problem and we hopefully end with a patient solution with training being the center of our universe. Many partners around the world and in Canada that are participating uh, and we appreciate every single one of them. Um, and uh, we have international partners as well. And I thank you very much for your time. So I'm just going to give you an overview of uh, some of the work that we've been doing with uh, SGSTN. Uh, SGSTN uh, 
uh, is one of the things that we do, a, a small part of what we do. Um, and we also have a network, which is not only within the UK, uh, but for uh, SJST and, and hypersensitivity, uh, we, have net we have created networks uh, across uh, the world. Uh, so start off with a disclosure slide that uh, um, what I'm going to show you is, was funded by the International Serious Adverse Event Consortium, a non-profit organization which has funded by pharmaceutical companies plus Wellcome Trust. All the data that we produce is publicly accessible uh, and is released so that other people can actually look at it. So that although it's a network we deve we've developed, hopefully getting access to data later and meta-analyzing that data will be important. So here's the um, network funded by the SAEC, as I said. Uh, but for focusing on uh, drug hypersensitivity, we created another acronym, International Consortium Drug Hypersensitivity, or ITCH. Um, and this, uh, with Liverpool as a coordinating center, and a number uh, of centers throughout the world, uh, which allowed us to be able to, uh, to get samples from across the world. So we had a phenotype standardization so that we, uh, and a case report form, so to make sure that we were collecting the right information, as Bruce has also said, um, but also the right um, kind of data which was missing so we could go back uh, and query a particular sites so that we could improve our data collection. The important thing also is that we needed uh, adjudication of patients and independently from what all the investigators were doing as well as what we were doing. And so um, uh, we got uh, Neil Shear, who's in the audience here at the front, and Peter Friedman to act as independent adjudicators of all the cases. We weren't just collecting SGST and we were collecting other types of hypersensitivity reactions as well. Um, and all of those cases were adjudicated. And the cases were only accepted and went to genome-wide analysis only uh, after they passed uh, adjudication. So uh, in terms of the scale uh, of what we've done so far, uh, is that we've undertaken GWAS in 1,260 patients, um, and uh, obviously that results in a large amount of data. Then you impute, um, and, and uh, it uh, increases the amount of variance that you have in each individual uh, case and control. Um, and then obviously one needs to uh, do the analysis, but before one could do the analysis, the quality control pipeline that we've tried to develop uh, to make sure that you don't get the false positives that are very likely to occur in this. Um, and the other aspect, and I th hope that we can discuss this, um, is about replication, because we are dealing with rare events, um, and replication can be quite difficult, um, even when you try to stick to the same phenotype, but again, phenotypes can vary across the world, um, and uh, we, one, we do need to think about how we move forward together uh, in terms of replicating particular genetic associations. So here's the um, Caucasian patient groups uh, for only SGST, and that was, so we've got 177 SGST and cases which are Caucasian <coughs> origin here, um, and, and we've tried to uh, relate them to uh, Caucasian controls. These are not drug-exposed controls, but we can use non-drug exposed controls here because SGST in is relatively uncommon. Um, and the three cluster you see is the top cluster is Northern Europeans, uh, the cluster uh, on um, your, uh, your right, my left, uh, is Spanish, and the other one uh, is Italian. So r really this is the Caucasian cluster. We do have cases from other ethnic groups as well. And, and the analysis was then stratified according to ethnicity. So when you actually take the 177 cases, you then look at whether there's an association with anything at genome-wide level, irrespective of drug etiology. I know most of the work uh, in the world so far has focused on drug-related uh, uh, associations. You find uh, a very strong association, which is genome-wide significant, with B7301. Uh, this is irrespective of drug etiology. Um, and when we dig deeper uh, into this, uh, is that uh, it seems to be driven mostly by the Italian 
ancestry rather than Spanish or, or Northern European ancestry. Now, it's going to be very difficult for us to re, uh, replicate that straight away. We will have to recruit more patients over many years uh, to be able to get enough Italian patients to be able to replicate this. Uh, so if you do have uh, a freezer full of Italian samples, please come and talk to me. The other things then also become interesting is that you can actually replicate things which are already in the literature. Now, we know that there is a very strong association with 58 to 1 and allopurinol, um, and that's been shown in many different populations. But you can see here that even with a very small number, only 13 SCAR cases, which includes hypersensitivity syndrome and SGS, uh, we were able to show a strong association, which is genome significant. Uh, and when you just look at SGS, again, that you can see uh, the p-value uh, on that. So it's good that, you know, even though we were uh, trying to, we have replicated other things, it's important as a positive control, if you like. So the other thing that we also did as part of this was to move not only uh, into um, Europe, but also into Africa, and we set up a study, prospective study in Malawi, where there's a huge burden of HIV, and nevirapine at that time was the uh, most frequently used uh, drug as part of the antiretroviral combination therapy that was used. And so we uh, then undertook uh, an analysis, not only SGSine, but other things as well, um, and we found that the association which was strongest was with CO401 with SGSTEN, uh, and uh, this was done by HLA sequencing. We then went on to a genome-wide association study, and that's just been published. And again, the CO401 was uh, replicated. But I think um, we do need to move beyond genomics, and we need to look at other things. And uh, uh, we did some molecular modeling, and we were able to show that it, it may po probably bind to the B pocket of the CO401. And we then looked at uh, uh, interactions, and interactions, um, I won't have time to go through the biological uh, reasons for looking at this, but there was potential protective effect of a gene called ERAP2, which has been particularly associated, uh, ERAP1, particularly with the uh, ankylosing spondylitis. So I was told, what is the most significant genetic, most significant things which have been identified uh, over the last few years? So, okay, different people may have different perspectives. So overall, most significant have been the genetic associations have been identified not only with SGSTN, but with lots of different things. And I think that has been a hugely important thing. So since the beginning of the century, 24 different HL alleles identified uh, on the slide, which are there. But I think we do need to look at whole systems, and I think the key translational finding which changed the future would be that it's unlikely to be one. It's going to be a combination of different things. We need collaboration and better coordination across the uh, world um, and systems approaches where necessary. We're not only looking at genomics, but also immunology, uh, uh, proteomics, metabolomics, and trying to combine that better understanding of mechanisms. And the key finding from that would be a druggable target. I know that people are trying all these uh, immunological, anti-immunological agents at the moment, but we don't really have a druggable target or druggable targets which can be better used for treatment, and that would be the key finding. So thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm staying in Europe for the moment uh, with these um, data and I'd like to give you an overview on what we have done in different studies, the current one called Registar. Now, the approaches we had were first case registries and also case control studies. We wanted to look for incidence and frequency and demographic data, and the case registry we started in Germany was already in 1990, so many years ago. And in parallel, there were case control studies done, the SCAR and the Euroscar study, and they mainly focused at the etiology. So we looked at exposure times and did a risk estimation for drugs, and some of you may have seen that. Now, these studies were uh, focusing on SJS and TN and the overlap condition, as you see here. Um, I mention this because later we also come to some other reactions. Now, to set up these studies, we needed certain requirements. Uh, we needed to initiate um, a network for the organization, um, the clinical definition of entities, and we are very happy that our definition that was published in 1993 is now worldwide used for these conditions. 
Um, we did a systematic case ascertainment and a standardized case validation. The case validation is not done by the person who ascertains the data, and it's not done by the treating physician, but by an independent committee. Um, the professional data management is ensured and the statistical analysis, and we had different uh, data centers for the studies, and now uh, we had it in the US, we had it in France, and nowadays in Germany. Now, case ascertainment is done by a trained investigator who travels out and visits the patient in the acute stage of the disease in the treating hospital. And then a standardized questionnaire is used to obtain the data. And very often, if the patient is really um, severely ill and in intensive care, we need help of relatives, of treating physicians, the family physician, the medical records. And at that point, also, a blood is sampled and a biopsy specimen, and the blood is stored centrally. Um, and follow-up investigations um, are scheduled. Now, this is um, from our original protocol, how uh, the network works. You see, we call them at that time clinical monitors or investigators who visit the hospitals to obtain the data. They have a national supervisor in the various countries. There's a steering committee uh, that also includes um, the uh, independent uh, experts to review the cases. Um, and the case review is done in clinical terms without knowledge of the inducing agent or suspected agent. That is the different process when this is assessed. And on all these validated cases go into the registry. Uh, part of that um, of those patients entered a cohort study, and for most of the patients we do have samples, of course not for those who die too early uh, to be sampled. Now the major achievements we had of that study were the estimation of the incidence with population-based data in Germany, because we captured the entire country, evaluation of demographic factors in large study populations, and we estimated the drug risk through case control studies too at the time so consecutively. And causality assessment in each individual case is done independently, and this is important for the patients and their relatives in terms of knowing which drugs they can ever take again, uh, or whether it was not a drug cause. And it's important for the genetic analysis, as we have heard before. Now, we continued over time with different focus. Um, one was to look at the path uh, mechanisms, and this uh, was done through the registries, for example, this uh, International Registra project that we'll, I will talk more about in a minute, and through cohort studies, also part of that setting, uh, and there we looked for survival, sequelae, and treatment. Now, the international registry started as a European registry, but now there's different partners from other countries outside of Europe. Uh, the focus on SJSTN, but also on other types of scar, like acute generalized exanthematous pustulosis, AJAP, or what is called drug reaction with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms, or HSS in Canada. And uh, we also, uh, in recent years, look for generalized bolus-fix drug eruption, which may easily be um, misdiagnosed as TEN. Now, the organization is done in a way that nowadays the coordination and the data center are both in Germany, in Freiburg, but in different places in the university, and the blood bank is in Paris, and there's a certain a procedure that ensures that the clinician and those who collect the data do not have direct access to the samples, uh, but this is done through the data center. Uh, so uh, there's a, a process that has been approved by the European Commission and by all ethical committees. Now this is the participating countries. These were the ones when we started um, in this um, uh, European Commission paid um, startup for three years, and these are the uh, countries that are nowadays uh, contributing data, also outside of Europe, Taiwan, and South Africa. Now, um, I just want to mention that we also looked at the continuous surveillance of drugs uh, in the Registra project, and I'm just pointing out this that we used an algorithm on more than a thousand cases uh, with definite and probable uh, SJSNTN, and we could see that uh, 
more than 65%, so 67 something uh, of these cases had a probable or very probable drug cause. But as you can see, for many cases, we could not identify a clear drug cause. And this uh, data is consistent with the data we had earlier from the case control studies. So there's a high percentage of cases probably without drug use that we have to care for. Now, to briefly mention the centralized organization of uh, the biological samples, what do we do or did we do with that? Uh, this is just a small example, as it was mentioned several times today, on carbamazepine or allopurinol. As you can see, the pattern is very different uh, for Europeans compared to East, uh, Southeast Asians and Chinese uh, persons. So in Europeans, HLA 1502 is not of any help. Uh, and only partly this allele in allopurinol. What else did we do? It was a GWAS study. Uh, and as you can see here, the chromosome 6 is the important area. Um, and for the specialists among you, here is the zoom up in red, and all is on chromosome 6 in the HLA region. Now, the last point I want to mention is the constitution of a cohort, our aim. This is the original aims that were um, presented uh, to the European Commission and for what our study was granted originally. So the cohort should have approximately 300 patients. It fortunately had even more. And we wanted to look at outcome, prognostic factors, sequelae, and impact on quality of life. And I just briefly want to mention the steps we did. We had a follow-up investigation uh, about eight or 10 weeks after the acute clinical phase where an investigator went to see the patient again. Uh, we also had a one-year follow-up, which was based on questionnaires, a specific questionnaire for SJSTN and a quality of life questionnaire. And we have now finalized the five-year follow-up um, and this was especially the long-term period uh, for those patients who had already participated in the, in the um, earlier follow-up study. Now, here, one of the pictures of late sequelae that you may see in the acute state of the disease three months later, three years later, and you may think, oh, that's not such a big deal, but it really does affect the patients. And we know that they have much more problems, especially with the eyes, uh, and we will hear about that later on. Now, the achievements here are the centralized collection uh, of samples of SJSTN, but also of other types of SCAR. We also have samples of dress in Egypt. Um, we know from the genetic studies that ethnicity um, matters concerning the risk of SCAR more than we had previously thought. Um, the genetic study also shows that uh, the correct clinical diagnosis is highly important and that causality assessment done in an appropriate way is crucial. And cohort studies revealing the high frequency of uh, sequelae and survivors um, are quite of interest also for how to address this issue in the future. And there's many questions to solve. For example, there are many um, cases without risk drug risk factors, as mentioned, and we have to see which are the non-drug risk factors and how can we identify them and address them. And in despite of increasing knowledge, we lack understanding of the mechanisms. We know there's a lot of pieces of the puzzle, but it's not complete yet. And how and why do T cells attack the skin, for example? You may have different hypotheses on that. And the death rate remains high. And how could we find treatments to interfere with the pathogenetic mechanisms so they are effective. This was already mentioned before. And now I try to complete the form that was submitted by Elizabeth. And you know, what is helpful and has been done in the group, the clinical definitions, the estimation of risk factors, collection of samples, causality assessment in each individual case for the studies to come. And what is partly of external origin but still helpful it's the new method to investigate mechanisms. That's something we're working on, and we certainly also need collaboration, and new therapeutic options. And what is harmful? The use of a, a false clinical classification can be harmful. The use of erroneous, erroneous causality assessment can be harmful. And it is also a threat that if we focus too much on one point, we may forget the patient, and we should never forget the patient in this condition. <coughs> All what we do in research is 
to help the patients. And I also think that genetic studies are helpful, but they won't solve all problems. Um, I'm sure about that. Now, we hope that more clinicians and researchers are ready to work on SCAR. We also hope that regulatory agencies, drug manufacturers, patient association, and others will support the tedious effort of data collection, case validation, blood sampling, lab experiments, and so forth. And um, I hope that despite the need of high motivation and frustration tolerance, the effort will be rewarded. Uh, not only by uh, pint of beer, but certainly also by the patient. Uh, thank you very much. So, um, good morning, everyone. So it is my great honor to, sta to, to stand before you today. Um, so I would like to thank you for the invitation, me to talk about the uh, uh, progression, uh, challenges, and opportunities of the sea farm and Thailand. Um, so here is a slide. So first of all, I would like to remind you about the Southeast Asia uh, for the C Farm. So uh, for C Farm, C Farm is a network for the pharmacogenomic researchers uh, who are working with their uh, with together. And so C Farm is the member of the C Farm is about. I'm sorry. Uh, 10 countries here, and so this net network, um, the delegate from each country, we are uh, consulted and work together uh, about the pharmacogenetics uh, aspect in the research and also the clinical practices. And so um, in this year, for C Farm, we have a project uh, which is called the Pharmacogenetics Database of Southeast Asia Populations. For this project, we aim to establish the database of 100 DMET genes and also the HLA class 1 and class 2 genes for uh, Southeast Asian populations. And also, finally, we would like to discover the pharmacogenetics market for severe adverse drug reactions. And I myself that involved with the C farm from Thailand, so I will take this opportunity to uh, um, um, sequence the 100 DMET genes and HLA genotyping for a sample from Thai SCAR project, which I will talk to you later about the Thai SCAR project. And so I summarize you here about the pharmacogenetics marker for uh, um, severe cutaneous adverse drug reaction for our Southeast Asia populations. And so can you see from, uh, from this table almost of the um, pharmacogenetics marker will come from Thai populations. And so you can see that all, even we are in different country, we are different populations, but we, I think that we can share the pharmacogenetics marker for uh, each country or each population. Uh, it looks like homogeneity of our populations. And so, as I mentioned, that almost of the pharmacogenetics marker uh, come from Thai study. Uh, so therefore, C Farm would like to encourage each country to do their own research. And so from the project that I mentioned to you, uh, this project that we would like to use as a mechanism to encourage each country to setting their, thai, uh, their country SCAR project and do their own um, pharmacogenetics marker risk uh, researches. And so, so as I mentioned that almost of the, I'm sorry, almost of the pharmacogenetics market were from Thai populations. So because in Thailand, so we have uh, a group of the pharmacogenetics uh, researchers uh, for three groups. The first group uh, is a group from Konkan University that led by Professor Wichitra Tassaniyakun that some of you might know her well. And the second is a group from Medical Genetic Center uh, led by Dr. Sulakame, and the last one, I myself, that work on the pharmacogenetic research in Ramathipati Hospital, Mahidon University, and so I do the pharmacogenetic research for severe cutaneous adverse drug reactions uh, by the sample from Thai SCAR. The Thai SCAR project is uh, the multidisciplinary network for SCAR study in Thai populations. And the sample were collected uh, prospectively um, 
from the multi centers. The center that I mentioned is a universal hospital, which is a super tertiary care hospital in Thailand. Uh, all of case were defined as a scar from two by at least two certified dermatologists, and all of the case were done for in vitro study, uh, in vitro assays, LTT tests, pharmacogenomics research, and patch tests, and. Uh, for pharmacogenomic and personal medicine laboratory, or PBM for short, we serve as the DNA and plasma banking for, uh, for this project. And so this figure summarizes you about the top of the cow product from Thai SCAR project. Uh, as you can see that almost of the uh, drug uh, that culprit for SCAR in Thai populations uh, are allopurinols, phenytoins, Cotimoxazoles and carbamazepine and so on. So, um, as I mentioned, that not just only the DNA that we collected from the Thai SCAR project, but we also collect the plasma and PBMC for all cases, and on also controls. And for all cases, we collect the clinical in the database, and some. And for the DNA, we do the HLA genotyping and some association, we do the in silico binding study. For example, like show you here in the figures, we uh, show the uh, binding of the uh, carbamazepine with the HLA B075 for uh, 1502, 1508, 1511, and 1521. And as mentioned, that all of the cases we done for in vitro assays, LTT tests, and skin patch tests by the clinicians. And so, uh, as we have a lot of the pharmacogenetics marker for our Thai populations, so we uh, decide to translate our knowledge into the clinical practices. In 2011, we set up, uh, sorry, we set up the um, uh, laboratory for pharmacogenomics and also the pharmacogenomic clinic um, uh, in Ramadhipati Hospital. And uh, this is a reference lab for our countries. So um, for the scar patients, how to, uh, when we would like to prevent the scar patients, so the most um, request from the physicians uh, show you here is uh, about the marker for carbamazepines, uh, allopurinols, and also abacavir. And so from 2011 until now, so, so you can see that the number of the uh, pharmacogenetics marker has been increased every year, from year by year. And so on the other hand, you can see that the number of the Steven Johnson syndrome uh, has been decreased for every year. So even it is not the effect from the pharmacogenetics marker for, for our effect from the pharmacogenetics marker, but the pharmacogenetics marker might be some, a part of, of this result. And so here, uh, as we have an experience to translate the pharmacogenomics into the clinical practices, so I just would like to share you the challenges for when we translate the pharmacogenomics into the clinical practices. So uh, I would like to example you the case of uh, pharmacogenetic screening for 1502 uh, in our Thai populations, and we learn from our loss and translate the our loss to be a knowledge management. The first case is a, a child who screened for 1502 and physician got the result as a positive for 1502. And so they know that uh, this patient have a high risk for uh, carbamazepine induced Steven Johnson syndrome and 10. So they choose another alternative choice. And the choice that, that physician choose for this child is oxcarbamazepine but the child, uh, a child got Steven Johnson syndrome later. So therefore, uh, from this case, we translate our knowledge, our, our experience into the knowledge management. So we encourage the hospital to lock the IT system for the prescription system. If the patient's uh, positive for 1502, the IT system lock to prescribe oxcarbamazepine and carbamazepine. Uh, for, for that patient. And for the second case, the se second case, 
a female death from carbamazepines. Even we already screened the 1502, and uh, she got a positive result for 1502. However, <coughs> physicians still prescribe carbamazepine for her, and she got 10 letters, and finally she died from carbamazepines. So what happened for this case? So she screened the uh, carbamazepine marker during GI in the eye patient, uh, inpatient ward. However, she come to follow up at the outpatient ward. But the electronic, electronic health record is not linked together. So that's why the outpatient, uh, our physicians, I mean like physician in the outpatient ward prescribed carbamazepine for her and she died later. So from this, so we encourage the uh, hospital and institute to uh, define the stakeholder and set up the communication systems and also uh, uh, set up the electronic health record wells for, to prevent uh, the case in the future. And the last cases, uh, this is very important for some patients who may not um, um, positive for 1502. For these children, uh, uh, we do the genotyping as a specific marker, 1502, and the result just only for positive and negative. So this student got a negative for 1502 marker. Okay. Uh, this student uh, got a positive marker for 1502. However, he got Steven Johnson syndrome. When we do the genotyping, we found that he positive for 1521, which is uh, the same serotype marker, uh, HLAB75 uh, uh, family. So uh, we encourage the, the uh, laboratory to um, screen the HLAB genotyping by uh, not just only a specific markers. And so I may conclude you that about the uh, seven primary requirements for the clinical implementation of pharmacogenomic, and you can uh, read the details by these articles. However, the key of success for the clinical implementations is the education and the knowledge. Meant. And also the multidisciplinary network might be very most important. So I would like to thank for my colleagues uh, my, and my teams, and thank you for your attention. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great honor to be here and to have a brief talk in the SJSTEN 2017 meeting today. I would like to express my gratitude to Professor Phillips and all members of the organizing committee. Uh, let me introduce a nationwide epidemiological data in Japan. We surveyed the SJSTEN cases experienced during 2005 to 7 for three years uh, from 212 facilities in Japan. As a result, SJS 255 cases, TEN 112 cases, a total of 370 registration forms were corrected. The annual instance per 1 million population was calculated to be 3.1 persons in SJS and 1.3 persons in TEN. SJST in ratio was 2.3 to 1. Uh, in Japanese classification, the category of SJST in overlap is included in TEN. Oh, here you can see uh, age distribution, uh, both SJS and TEN had a, a small peak in the 30s and the largest peak in the 60s. There was no obvious bias in the ratio of men and women. Or well, here you can see uh, two peaks in the number of days from the start of public drug administration to the appearance of rush, namely uh, within three days and 50 to 28 days. Uh, in SGSTEN caused by antibiotics, 70 to 80 percent of cases developed within two weeks. In contrast, anticonvulsants, uh, only 30 percent cases developed within two weeks, and 70 percent of cases developed within four weeks. Uh, similarly, 
End states include SGS TTTEN significantly earlier than anti comparisons. Next slide. Ah, okay. A common causative agent of SGS TTEN was antibiotics, end states, and anti comparisons. Uh, enforced rates of tests to determine causative agents were examined. Parts testing was performed in one third of cases, and the positive rate was around 10%. LST LTT was done in 50 to 60% of cases, and the positive rate was around 30%. In SJS cases, 86% healed without sequelae. 11% left sequelae and 3% died. In TEN cases, 50% healed without sequelae, 31% left sequelae, and 19% died. Mortality rate in a TEN was significantly higher than SJS. A rate of sequelae in TEN was also significantly higher than SJS. Let me show you the uh, data of pharmacogenomics in Japanese population. Uh, regarding carbamazepin, HLA-B1502 was not recognized among 61 patients with the scar, whereas HLA-B1511, uh, that belongs to the same uh, serotype of B17-5, uh, HLA-B1502 was recognized in four of 14 patients. In contrast, HLA-A 3101 was positive in 45 of 77 patients with carbamazepine induced scar. Odds ratio was 10.8. Regarding our purinol, HRAB15801 was found in 10 of 18 patients with scar. Odds ratio was 62.8. Nobody showed HRAB5701 among seven patients with abacabeo induced scar. In summary, the annual frequency of occurrence per 1 million Japanese population in our survey was 3.1 persons in SJS, 1.3 persons in TEN. The mortality rate was 3% in SJS and 20% in TEN. This incidence and mortality rate was similar to the epidemiological data in other countries. A significant association of HRA 3101 and carbamazepine induced scar was found. In addition, significant association of HRA B 5501 and aropurinol induced scar was recognized in Japanese patients. Uh, thank you for your thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. So Elizabeth has asked me to facilitate uh, this discussion. Uh, we have 20 minutes. Um, the clock is not quite right there. It says nine minutes. Um, uh, it now says, uh, there it says 20 minutes now. So that's an atomic clock ticking down. Um, you've got time to do short answers, short questions, short comments. You can be provocative. You can vent your anger, or you can find, uh, <laughs> give us solutions. Um, and, and the idea here is to really think about strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, so that we can actually come out with some positive things at the end. So, Terry, you're going to start off. Right, so, so I'm not going to vent anger or, or be provocative, probably. But I did want to ask Professor Suecki and maybe maybe all of you. Um, it, it seemed as though your your rates of, of complications after um, recovery was was relatively low. You said 86% had no complications. So 14% did. I just wonder, is, is that low? And if so, are there population differences also in the rate of complications you know, following recovery? Who wants to answer that? Do, do you want to take it? Do you? I did not get the question. I'm sorry. <laughs> so the question was the rate of complications uh, after, after recovery, uh, population, oh, yeah. population differences. Um, I, I think. I think I think we don't have good data on the difference by population in terms of sequelae because we don't yet have large studies of sequelae in a large number of patients. What the, these sequelae are frequent. 
when you deal with SGS or TDM, what is, uh, okay, that, that will be my only answer now. Anybody else want to say anything quickly? Maya? Yes, I mean, you, the question was also whether you have a higher rate in one of the diseases, is that right? So we do see a higher frequency in the more severe reactions, a higher frequency of sequelae. It's more than 90%, but it's almost as high in SGS and overlap. It's slightly lower, but I don't even know if it's significant, but substantially lower, no. So I think we all knew that there were sequelae, but we didn't really have the way to quantify it. We are doing it now with our five-year follow-up to see what happens after that time. I will briefly report about that later. Please, tell us whether this is a strength, weakness, opportunity, or threat that you're gonna ask about. A question, so Caroline Mitchell, and I'm an OBGYN from Boston, um, and you have such a wealth of cohorts and places to look at effects of SJS TEN, and I'm just, hoping that all of you are collecting data on GU sequelae, and um, just that's my big question is, I'm speaking later and my message of my talk is gonna be remember the vagina. And so I just wanna ask if you're measuring those outcomes and how you are and um, if there's any sense of the prevalence of those complications and sequelae. So you want to know about genital urinary complications yes. in SGS, TEN, and how well they're collected across the different yes. networks. Thank you for summarizing. Yeah. And ocular complications. Yeah, yeah, okay. Ocular complications. So um, maybe the people who are doing some of the work here, do you want to sort of, uh, um, say well, something? Well, just else? a comment that um, you'll be pleased to know that among the dermatology hospitalist community, every female patient gets an OBGYN consult, and every patient gets an ophthalmology consult uh, with SJSTN. Um, but one of the things I didn't get a chance to really talk about uh, is that we are trying now with our cohort to go back and look at the survivors in a detailed fashion to look at quality of life, ophthalmologic, some uh, 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 validated uh, measures of uh, ocular sequelae as well as sexual uh, dysfunction and other things. So I think this is a really important um, area that there's been very little, little in the literature on. Um, just a very recent um, article uh, uh, came out about um, uh, PTSD and other kind of psychological sequelae, but I think these things are really important, and it is something we're very interested in, in looking at. Um, just, to, just to keep going on that, we, as part of the actual clinical trial, we're looking at um, outcomes of three, uh, three months and, and 12 months afterwards to actually, and focusing on not only um, whether or not there is visible disease left over or visible sequelae, but also patient reported outcomes on how well they feel. Um, and in their own personal life, because that's we know it affects survivors, and we want to know and quantify that, and whether we actually can change that with drug treatment. And it's also a, an integral part of the assessment of the patient to know what their mucosal as well I are. Bruce. Yeah. So those are outcomes that are really important, also in pediatrics. Um, one of the great things about our active surveillance network is that we can follow these patients for years. And so our longest serving patients now, our longest served patients have been followed since 2004. So we follow them completely um, to resolution and uh, many of them have sequelae that are, is lifelong and we try to support that. Particularly important I think as sexual health is developing in, in children and the ophthalmologic complications are a big problem for uh, social development and learning. So these are things that are two critical endpoints that we always follow. And the great thing about our network, I think, is that if you came to me and said that we'd like these data on this um, and we put together a cohort, I can actually go into the records still across the country and update that. So if the last update we had was two years ago, we're not limited by uh, data that's two years old. I'll go up and we'll, we'll update those. And that's something that I'm working very hard with the federal government to allow us to continue to do uh, forever so that we maintain our registry um, over time so it's always complete and that's something that I'm trying to encourage um, them to understand is the limitation of epidemiology is often the, da the incomplete data set and so we, we will be as complete as it is and if there is no GU consult then we will get one. So, so it's likely to be variable across different networks uh, but one opportunity here for this meeting is to actually standardize that so that we have a complete data set across different networks, and that might certainly be an opportunity. 
Sorry, um, do you want to yeah. ask a question? Jim Chodosh from Boston. So we all know the weaknesses of retrospective studies or data collection, and, and we all know that if you don't look for it, you don't find it. And the, even in our registries, if we don't ask the right questions, number one, and if we don't have the right examiners, number two, we're going to miss data. So many of the eye findings, for example, and I'm sure that's also true for the gynecologic findings, are going to be missed by the wrong practitioners. So when we talk about sequelae, the first thing that comes to my mind, similar to what Charles raised, is what questions are you asking, number one, and number two, who's doing the examinations? Because this is a, you know, taking care of patients with SJS as an ophthalmologist, I can tell you that most of the findings are missed. And many of these findings lead to long-term visual sequelae, often blindness. So this is a, you know, there's a gap in the reporting and the examination. So I think as, as things are done going forward, it needs to be done in a certain way with attention to not just the right questions, but also the right examiners. Okay. So current weaknesses at the moment in terms of what we do, but opportunities to be able to standardize it, to be able to improve things for the future. Yeah, a treatment. I don't know if it's what Charles wants me to say, but treatment has a major impact on the outcome. You can come believe. to this microphone, you know. <laughs> yeah, come on, Charles, ask your own question. But you know, treatment can have a major impact, and it's one thing to say, well, uh, you know, we had uh, this degree of ocular sequelae, but all, many of those patients are treated differently. That's something a registry can do wonderfully if you collect enough patients. We're hopeful to look at that data. So on this area, maybe the last comment, but we can then move on to other aspects of strengths, weakness, opportunities, sure. and threats. Charles Bouchard from Loyola in Chicago, ophthalmology. So um, we have about 190 patients with SJS over the last 12, 15 years, uh, and that uh, there have been some great progress in the acute management of Stephen Johnson, the ocular disease, with human amniotic membrane. Uh, and the, uh, the issues, the challenges are finding the, you know, and associating ophthalmologists with the burn units uh, and getting them available and aware of the acute management because a lot of these patients, that if they're not treated within one week of the onset of the conjunctivitis, they can have significant long-term sequelae. So just as an awareness issue, we have a treatment that seems to work uh, and it has to be done within seven days. That's fine. Okay. Thank you. So um, uh, just to move it along, I guess what you heard today is many different uh, networks which are there, which is certainly a strength, isn't it? Because people are developing networks. This is rare, um, multi-center collaborations. But maybe a weakness as well that comes across is actually most of networks are probably independent, and there's no kind of uh, uh, merger or crosstalk between the networks. Or, uh, you know, so, so I think maybe that is a weakness. So please discuss, panel. Jean-Claude? Most, I, I, have a general, I have a general um, comment on most the uh, presentations that were done this morning. I think that there were often no, uh, no uh, reference to the classification that you use. I found also uh, no uh, information on the method used for attributing drug causality. And if we are speaking of uh, collecting uh, samples or blood samples and so on for looking for genetic association, at least the first point is to have a very well-defined genotype. The second one is to be quite sure of the drug uh, at, uh, to which the disease is attributed. And uh, I think that very few persons explain how do you do that, and uh, I think it should be improved. Okay, um, so he did, like a politician, he didn't quite answer the question I asked, <laughs> but, but go ahead. <laughs> so this is about the, uh, I mean, here, so I answer your question. The, the, I, the opportunity is that... Well, um, the, or the, the weaknesses of networks not working together. I That's mean, right. you know, part of the challenge here is funding, uh, which in, in Canada is, you know, to be used in Canada. Um, and our American colleagues uh, have funding from their NIH to fund projects in the United States. Um, sometimes these networks cross borders, but in general we stay within our country boundaries. 
Um, the other problem is that we're all trying to get funding to run these systems, and these are expensive. I've even had trouble in Canada convincing um, hospitals, not to mention any names, Hospital for Sick Children, <coughs> um, that, you know, I buy this expensive multi-million dollar equipment to do all this genotyping and sequencing and use our equipment. Well, they don't want to use our equipment. They want to use their own equipment. They want to build their own programs. Um, and so I say, look, the amortization period is three to five years for this equipment. Use it. You know, it'll get cheaper. It'll get better. Uh, you can jump on at that point, but they don't want to do that. They want to create their own system. So it can be very difficult, especially with a country that's 6,000 kilometers long, as big as Canada is, to get everyone together within our own country even to, to do these things. And so we're competitive by nature in academia. We, uh, we compete for grants. That's part of the peer review process. And I think that's a challenge to overcome. Um, sometimes I think that, you know, if we had a uh, WHO that had funding, um, we would do these things globally. Uh, maybe, uh, uh, you know, altruists can help us fund international networks. I was saying to Munir earlier that, um, it, you know, one of the, th the issues that really irritates me is somebody taking a paper that I've written in Nature Genetics, for example, or any other great uh, journal that's 3,000 words long and then trying to replicate our work that took maybe eight to ten years to create uh, by just reading the paper and trying to replicate that. That's not reproducibility science. I think we have to get better at how we reproduce each other's work and how we support the work that's done there. Um, the most important question in reproducibility isn't whether your finding is reproduced, but uh, what questions that brings. If it's not, uh, if it's not reproduced, if it's not reproducible, then what, what, was, what is different between the populations of patients? So I think these are lots of challenges, but I think we need some sort of different kind of global funding that can allow this to, to proceed. And that's just tricky. You know, yeah. even with the IASE, AEC, it's, it's tough. So currently available funding mechanisms promote competition, but not really collaboration. Yep. Okay, but obviously the lack of funding overall is a threat as well. Um, so I managed to get one of the MPs in uh, the UK to ask a question of the government as to how much funding there was for SGST and in the UK, and they came back and said uh, um, uh, basically that they were funding lots of rare diseases um, and no specific mention of SGST and so that's the difficulty. So I think that is a threat, lack of funding throughout the world uh, in terms of taking uh, things forward. So things from the audience, any, any questions, comments, and, and in terms of some of the areas that we've just uh, talked about? Uh, hello, this is Cynthia Sung, Health Science Authority in Singapore. Um, I thought I'd heard um, uh, Professor Micheletti say that he did not find uh, a benefit of IVIG and corticosteroids, but that was different than from Professor Worley, where you did. And is there an opportunity to maybe do, with all these networks, like a meta-analysis or even um, some kind of uh, coordination and collection of data on that point? Sorry, I, to clarify, I, I have not found, so I, I don't have data. So it, historically, through all the data, looking at all of the data overall, there is no benefit to steroids or IVIG. Right, and then I heard from Professor Worley that you did see a benefit. So is, that's Dr. That, is that what I heard? I, I, yeah. or please correct me if it was wrong. Yeah. Did you see a benefit? No, so in our, in our cohort, we did not see, we did not have any statistical significance of benefit. The, there was a group that had received steroids and then later in the course IVIG and they seem to do a little bit better and there are some small um, amount of data in the literature that shows something similar. But that being said, we really you know, weren't able to say. At the same time, we also felt like um, there's a bias toward prescribing IVIG, at least in the U.S., toward more to, to sicker patients, not necessarily accounted for by the SCORE 10. So um, our future analyses for this cohort include things like, um, you know, propensity score matching, so trying to account for why a particular patient gets a particular drug in order to dive deeper into that question. Um, but as of now, we don't have anything to say that uh, either steroids or IVIG is any better than supportive care. Oh, okay. So, okay. Um, but maybe it's still, okay. it's a, still a big question mark. Sure. I so maybe you, you can continue the discussion after. Is that all right? Because I see a long line of people <laughs> wanting to ask questions. So just to give them opportunity, go ahead. Um, I'd be interested in knowing what type of genetic testing is being proposed for the various prospective trials, um, whether it's just HLA genotyping or GWAS or whole exome. 
Um, I would uh, presume that with GWAS you're finding more common variants and with SGS being a rare disease, maybe we need to be looking at more rare variants and whether whole exome sequencing might be uh, a better avenue. So I'm wondering for especially the people who are looking prospectively at genetic testing, uh, what type of testing is being employed? So what are you planning to do? So from the nation's perspective, we're looking at whole genome sequencing of the inflammasome. Um, as well as uh, looking specifically at T cell, re re like T cell uh, rearrangement, T cell receptor rearrangements, and also in addition, HLA high for like uh, uh, high sensitivity sequencing for actually uh, HLA types for, for all patients. So, we're actually trying to look so at genome that. sequencing of the inflammasome rather than whole genome sequencing. Well, so, doing whole genome sequencing and then trying to look at yeah. patterns of what we get out with. So, okay. not trying to narrow it too much because you may miss things that. Okay. Uh, and have we worked out the sample size for something like that? So uh, in, we have 267 patients that will be in the actual trial. Um, so it's to be done on, so collecting samples on everybody. Okay. Thank you. Um, Kimberly Sipple, an ophthalmologist. Um, I'm at Cornell in New York. Um, a quick comment and then two questions. I'm going to echo what my colleagues um, have said that um, in ophthalmology, uh, we generally say the skin heals well, except perhaps some pigmentary changes, but the ocular surface heals with marked cicatricial changes and we consider it a blinding condition. Um, but my questions are, um, the first is, uh, there was a comment, uh, I think from two presenters, that um, IVIDG and non-pulse steroids um, have not, up to this point, been found to be beneficial. Uh, any comment on pulse steroids? So, oh. early data, there's, mm -hmm. two, there's two good uh, actual studies that looked at pulse steroids mm -hmm. uh, and found benef some benefit, mm -hmm. the, but they were very small. Yes. Um, certainly in some of the slight phosphorin data mm -hmm. and the Tenercept, mm -hmm. there seems to be some improvement. Mm -hmm. um, but again, small, small studies. I, I can't remember specifically on the, the phase two study that was done out of, um, out of France, whether the, I can't remember the complication rate, but there was certainly better time to reepithelialization in that, mm -hmm. in those people. Yes, yes. So, um, so that's still a, c a question. If, um, then the second, my second question is um, skin biopsies at the acute, in the acute stage. At our, the hospital I'm with, um, they will not call, consider a patient as having SJS or TN unless a skin biopsy is positive. Um, just in regard to all these um, registries, is that uh, an inclusion criteria for the registries, a positive skin biopsy? Um, a skin biopsy is certainly helpful to exclude a number of other blistering conditions. Mm -hmm. So we are really in favor of this being done. It's a small mm -hmm. thing to do, and every physician could do it. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it's not uh, a definite sign of TN, because mm -hmm. if you took a biopsy right, right out of the central blister of erythema multiforme, you get mm -hmm. the same result. Mm -hmm. And if you took the biopsy right out of generalized bolus fixed drug eruption, you get the same result. Mm -hmm. So you always have to put the clinical picture and the histopathology together. Mm -hmm. It's also the question when it is taken, where it is taken. So mm -hmm. the complete picture is important. Yes. Um, and I wonder if I could give one small comment on the, the discussion on the immunoglobulins and um, the steroids for treatment. We did a, a large um, um, systematic review, which will, published, uh, will be published next month. Uh, and uh, the, the outcome finally is that steroids may have some benefit, quad vitam. We can say anything about sequelae. And if they are helpful or not, I don't really think so. Um, and that IVIG did not show any benefit in this uh, setting. Um, and I think others have shown that too. So I think IVIG should not be our main issue anymore in the treatment of SJSTN. Thank you. Okay, so I'm afraid the atomic clock has gone red. Oh. So I do. Okay, okay. Um, Hi, I'm Katie. Just Meyer. one more to finish then, okay. <laughs> I'm a SJS survivor 30 years ago, and I just had to um, comment on the uh, percentage of no incidence of um, problems years out. 
Um, I do appreciate being here in the study you're doing in research, um, but I'd like to say that with my non-medical research on this thing called social media, I can tell you the stories that I read daily that every single SJS survivor has medical problems for the rest of their life. Okay, well that's a very important thing to finish on. So uh, please thank the panelists.